Hello and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown. Today is Wednesday, December the 22nd, 2021. This is the last rundown episode for the year. I am Tom Hollingsworth and I am bringing you not the news of the week, but a recap of some of the excitement that we've seen over the last 12 months. And joining me is my friend, my faithful co-host for this exciting journey into the world of IT news, Mr. Stephen Foskett. Stephen? Welcome to this wrap-up show. It's great to be here, and we've had a busy year. We have. We uh, we spent the last week going over all of the news stories that we brought to you over the, the last 52 weeks, and uh, we picked out some of our favorites. Uh, as you saw in the last episode of The Rundown, we kind of hit some of our highlights, but we wanted to make sure that we had a chance to kind of cover some of the cool stuff that happened, and there may even be a surprise or two waiting towards the end of the episode. But let's jump in and let's kind of start where the year started back in January. Um, honestly, Stephen, I think the biggest story out of January and possibly even one of the biggest stories that we had in the rundown all year was was your favorite. And uh, when we got the news live that Pat Gelsinger had announced that he was going to be headed from VMware to Intel. Absolutely. And this was, as you say, one of the biggest news stories of the year, simply because Intel is one of the biggest and most important companies in the enterprise tech space by all accounts. And frankly, Intel needed a little kick in the uh, administration offices to move uh, move onward and continue its uh, customary level of industry dominance. And frankly, I can't think of a better choice for the job than Pat Gelsinger. When I heard that that was the choice they made, I uh, predictably reacted with shock and amusement. And frankly, it set the tone for Intel all year long. We did, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we talked about this on the rundown. We talked about this on our on-premise IT roundtable podcast, and we kept revisiting it. And for me, I'm going to say that uh, Pat Gelsinger going to the, taking the CEO chair at Intel and the, the things that he's done at Intel already in less than a year are, for me, probably one of the biggest stories of 2021. Because frankly, as I said, this is a, a hugely important company and they have been executing all year long. Yeah, I would agree that that he has definitely charted a course for Intel compared to Bob Swan, who by all accounts is pretty much just a kind of a manager. Pat's a visionary and he's done a really amazing job especially given the way that 2021 turned out with a lot of the things that we were hearing about chips and, and shortages and stuff like that, which we'll get into just in a little bit. But I would agree. I think that this news was probably the biggest story of 2021, just kind of taken for what it was, but also for what it detailed over the, the next months of the year. Speaking of CEO changes, though, Stephen, back in February, we got another big announcement, and that was... Um, Astronaut Jeff Bezos decided to step down from his little online bookstore and uh, focus full time on launching himself into space. And in order to uh, take the reins of that, he selected Andy Jassy, who was the CEO of Amazon Web Services. Um, I think this was a big story just because you had the founder stepping down and putting his trusted lieutenant in charge. And given what we've seen from Amazon over the last year, do you feel like this was a good move on Jeff's part? And has this materially impacted the whole of Amazon? And also, has it impacted AWS not having Andy at the helm? Absolutely. As uh, I can't think of a better person to take over Amazon from Jeff Bezos than uh, Andy Jassy. I mean, this is someone who really single-handedly conceived of and built uh, Amazon into the web services powerhouse that it is today. And frankly, Amazon is more a web services company than it is an online bookstore or a store of everything or all the things that, uh, you know, your mom thinks it is. Uh, truly, Andy Jassy has uh, done the right things with AWS, and I expect that he'll do the right things with Amazon as a whole. Uh, for me, a bigger question was what happens to AWS now that uh, he is uh, looking away. And he was replaced by uh, Adam Solipsky. Uh, Adam has actually done a pretty nice job as well. And interestingly, as we saw at uh, AWS reInvent, 
he has refocused the company uh, more toward uh, software as a service and uh, more vertically integrated services instead of little components and building blocks uh, as Andy Jassy had directed it. And I think that that's uh, probably a good move given the current state of the cloud. Yeah, I would say that that they're in good hands, and I feel better overall that the CEOs and the the managers of these two business units are focused on the business and not on building a rocket. And I think that that will pay off handsomely as we move into 2022. I know that there's some wrinkles and some things that need to be worked out. Um, Amazon had some stability issues, but all clouds are going to have that. And I think that we'll eventually get to a point where it will it will work itself out the way that it's supposed to. Well, Stephen, when we get to March, um, we had a little bit of a bombshell from Micron saying that they are going to be exiting the 3D Crosspoint business. Now, 3D Crosspoint, of course, is an Intel storage technology for um, persistent memory uh, that has evolved into Optane and a bunch of other things. And being a storage person, I, I feel like this was something that was kind of a crossover for you. We're talking about Intel. We're talking about storage. We're talking about the fact that Micron suddenly decided that this wasn't an area they wanted to play in anymore. Micron and Intel uh, worked together to bring uh, 3D Crosspoint to the market, but frankly, Micron never actually brought it to the market. Apart from, I believe, one product, uh, they never really productized it. Uh, frankly, Intel has uh, not executed on 3D Crosspoint as much as many would have hoped uh, years ago. But, uh, you know, it seems like that corner is starting to be turned, uh, as we saw at the end of 2020 and all throughout 2021, uh, we have next generation 3D Crosspoint Optane products coming out of Intel. Uh, we've seen a, a renewed focus on it. When Intel uh, spun off their NAND uh, SSD business to SK Hynix, which by the way, just closed today, uh, we are seeing that Intel is keeping the Optane and 3D Crosspoint business. So I think that it's uh, not really surprising that Micron had enough of it since Unlike Intel, they're not trying to push a competitive server platform. They're really just trying to sell components and commodities. And frankly, uh, 3D Crosspoint wasn't doing it for them. But Intel, on the other hand, Intel is willing to invest in platform components like high performance networking, uh, persistent memory, uh, FPGAs, et cetera, to try to build the market for Xeon. And I think that that's really the story here more than uh, Micron dropping out. Yeah, and given the fact that Intel then immediately followed that up in April with the introduction of Ice Lake, I think that it kind of tells that story that Intel is maybe wanting to focus on the enterprise market. They're wanting to focus more on their kind of the, what we consider their bread and butter and get away from this idea of diversifying their portfolio to offer a little bit of everything. How do you feel like the introduction of Ice Lake really kind of solidified Intel's position in the market? Well, yeah, it seems that uh, there were sort of two countervailing uh, stories going on throughout 2021 with regard to server CPUs, especially. So on the one hand, you had uh, AMD with their phenomenal uh, Zen line of, of CPUs, uh, the Epic server CPUs with their tons and tons of cores, uh, good pricing. I mean, everybody loves the product. Uh, Intel was really kind of behind the curve there. In fact, they were late to market with PCI Express 4.0. They didn't have as many memory channels and they didn't have as many cores. And that really wasn't a good uh, look for this chip making giant. Uh, so that's why uh, the April introduction of the third generation Xeon scalable uh, CPUs called Ice Lake was actually a huge move because essentially it addressed most of those concerns. And it did it in a way that was typically Intel and ties in nicely with the previous story. In other words, Ice Lake isn't really a story of CPUs as much as it is a story of a next generation server platform that puts Intel back in competition with AMD Epic. And in fact, even though AMD still maintains a substantial lead in terms of number of cores, Intel's Ice Lake has been getting wins all year long on the back of the fact that it's a very practical platform designed and optimized for what hyperscalers and enterprises are looking for. So I would say that this is actually a pretty positive move uh, for Intel overall, even though Ice Lake was pretty late to the party. Uh, and even though it's likely to get uh, swept aside and replaced fairly quickly, uh, even so, they were able to come to market with a very competitive product. 
Now, Tom, in May, we were looking at uh, security again. And frankly, again, this is one of those stories that just keeps on giving. Uh, I want to go back, though, to May to the ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline, because for me, that was the biggest story. Yeah, I think that May was really when we had seen the the ransomware malware epidemic kind of get ratcheted up a notch. Like we were we've seen companies get hit by this a lot. I mean, the Siemens breach on the surface was a lot bigger because it affected global shipping because it was, you know, WannaCry got infested in, into their systems very quickly and took a long time to root out. But it didn't make the news quite like this. I mean, we had a huge pipeline company being um, attacked. We had news that made like national news. Like my mom was calling me about it saying, you know, we've got uh, gas prices are going to go up. And boy, if this had happened in the dead of winter, think about all the heating oil that, that would have been affected. And then there was a lot of confusion. Did Colonial pay the ransom? Did Colonial actually do the due diligence of keeping these people out? Like, there was a lot of discussion around the process, not just the malware. And when you look at the people who were behind it and how quickly they were identified and then what happened to them after the fact, this summer was absolutely filled with uh, big ransomware crews hitting big targets, critical infrastructure targets, getting ransoms, and then going to ground before the FBI could find them. And I think that that in and of itself is a much bigger trend that I want to get into in just a little bit. But yeah, when Colonial was the first like big name company that got hit, a lot of people were looking around going, what's happening? And a lot of security analysts were like, uh, this has been going on for a while. They've just been hitting softer targets. Well, we can return to security in a moment, but uh, the next story that I've got here was one that kind of hit close to home for, for many of us. So in June, uh, we heard that uh, not just uh, that uh, Kirti and Partha and Pradeep were leaving uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, but we're starting to see some changes to that company. Now, these are people that we've known for a long time from Aruba Networks, which uh, HPE acquired. And uh, we had maybe thought that they might be the next generation staff behind HPE, but that's not in the cards. Yeah, it was it was kind of weird that this happened right around the 1st of June that that Kirti announced that he was leaving in and of itself. That would have been big news. The founder of Aruba Networks has decided that his he's had his time and he's finished and he wants to step away, which actually he was he stayed on staff until uh, actually about a month ago um, in an in a, in a, in a, uh, advisory role. But then we got that that kind of, you know, uh, second hit of that Partha, the CTO was leaving that Pradeep. Also, Pradeep Iyer, who was one of the chief architects, was gone. It felt like they were cleaning house in in a way. And Stephen, you and I had discussed this on the rundown. Where, you know, a lot of the money was on the possibility that Kirti could be the next CEO of HPE, and that didn't happen. But then, when you look behind the scenes and you realize that after the Silver Peak acquisition, a lot of the Silver Peak group was being integrated throughout Aruba there was a lot of discussion that maybe it was time for Kirti to kind of step aside. And when you look at the way that they have really kind of rebranded the edge to be more focused on things like AI and data collection and edge computing, as opposed to just kind of being a connectivity scenario. I mean, even just some of the latest announcements that they've gotten from their switching group, where they have edge switches with integrated DPUs to help accelerate workloads, it kind of says to me that that I think Kirti kind of saw the turn that was going to happen. And he said, you know what, I've, I've done enough of these. I think it's time for me to kind of step aside. And, and of course, in any kind of situation, whether it's uh, Pat Gelsinger stepping into the reins or Jeff Bezos going off to be a uh, spaceman, um, in, in Kirti's case, too, we wish them well. They obviously have done a lot for the industry, and we're really happy to see them kind of be able to kind of ride off into the sunset and enjoy whatever retirement looks like for them. But boy, when it hits you kind of all at once, you, you, you kind of have to take stock of, of what's going on. So that, that definitely was a big change for us. Absolutely. And we'll see what it means for HPE going forward. So let's get back to security stories. Of course, one of the biggest stories of the year in uh, international news is the NSO group and Pegasus spyware, which was finally exposed and spelled out and has basically been a continuing story all year long until now. Uh, tell us what we need to know about Pegasus. Boy, there's this is just the gift that keeps on giving. If, if we had 
a lot uh, the malware epidemic being the big news that came out of may we're thinking oh man how could it get any worse than this and then thanks to folks like john scott railton at citizen lab we found out oh it gets way worse and the more you scratch the surface on this the worse it looks so effectively what we had was an organization staffed by former intelligence individuals who were exploiting um, mal or they were exploiting uh, vulnerabilities in current iPhone software to surreptitiously install surveillance tools. And they were doing it without anybody noticing for years. And then the group at Citizen Lab run out of the University of Toronto got involved because activists were starting to be infected with these uh, this software. And they started realizing that this was much, much bigger than they thought. And we're even still seeing stories that were released um, just this week about how uh, it looks like uh, NSO Group was um, basically selling this to whoever was going to buy it, um, including some very not friendly governments. And uh, they even had specific rules, like you're not allowed to infect any phones that have a U.S. area code or a U.S. dialing code because that will tip the authorities. And sure enough, one of their customers decided to do it. And that was the beginning of the end for them. I mean, we are currently faced with a situation where NSO Group went from being kind of the darling of surveillance to being blacklisted by the U.S. Like, not only are they not able to be doing business with the U.S., no company but headquartered in the U.S. can sell them anything. So they can't buy any IT infrastructure. Um, their loans are coming due very quickly. Their CEO, the new one to replace the guy who founded it, quit after two weeks. Like, he, he took the job. They got blacklisted. He quit. Like, that's how quickly the tables turned for them. They're seriously starting to look at the possibility that they're going to have to dissolve everything. The, the holding group has been sued by Apple along with NSO group. Like everything is working against them. And now they are, they're faced with a very real possibility, not of jail time, not of fines, but that their customers are starting to go to other competitors that are not well known because just like we saw with the colonial pipeline attack, if you're in the intelligence space or in the crime space and you get found out, you get burned, basically, you're not very good to the rest of the people who rely on you. So NSO Group, kind of like SolarWinds last year, is one of those things that we're going to continually find out more and more about. And the more we find out about it, the worse it feels. All right, Stephen, we had a busy summer. And then we kind of took a little bit of a lull there in August as we were kind of catching our breath about a lot of the things that were going on. But one of the things that kind of popped up on our radar toward the end of the month that that maybe wasn't as big of a deal as we thought it might be was this huge Cosmos DB vulnerability in Microsoft Azure that exposed a lot of people. I mean, what do you make of that after such a, a big summer of quick hits? Well, I think we thought that this was going to be a, a huge uh, story that would continue all year round, but it turned out that Microsoft uh, was quick to respond, the customers were quick to respond, and uh, it uh, sort of fizzled. Uh, but that being said, it was a big story, and I think that it's worth looking back at it. So essentially, uh, what we found was there was a, a flaw in one of the Azure products, a very widely used one called Cosmos DB, that effectively allowed people to access other people's databases of information, and it exposed a lot of information, potentially uh, many, many corporate customers' data was uh, exposed through this flaw. Uh, that being said, uh, we really haven't heard much in terms of repercussions from this. I haven't seen many lawsuits. I haven't seen much mention of where that data went or what that data was. It is possible that maybe this flaw wasn't as bad as we thought it was, or it's possible that we just have some... Uh, uh, quiet uh, corporate customers that would rather not uh, let everybody know just how much data was was found. But that being said, it, I think it did expose the fact that uh, there are bugs in any infrastructure and uh, even Microsoft's uh, vaunted uh, Azure web services can also have problems. Yeah, fingers crossed that this one ended up being a little bit more on the less impactful side, just because, again, sometimes you want these things to have a happy ending. And by doing all of the things you're supposed to do, you want that to be the result. Um, but in a little bit of happier news, Stephen, but when we go to September, we actually had a huge new launch from Fujifilm. They launched LTO9. Um, somebody told me that tape is dead. Tape's not dead yet. 
Uh, it's like the parrot in the Monty Python sketch. Now, actually, tape is, uh, unlike the parrot, it is actually not dead. Uh, it is, in fact, a very useful technology that still has wide applications, even in the cloud. Now, nobody wants to talk about that because, frankly, tape is boring. But LTO9 shows us that, uh, in fact, the research and development continues and that there's a whole roadmap for LTO uh, tape going forward. Frankly, uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed this year was hearing from Fujifilm at our field day events where they pointed out the ecological benefits of tape. So, so here's the thing. A lot of people like to gripe and moan about how all of our compute infrastructure is destroying the planet. And um, I see that they've got a point when it comes to cryptocurrencies and basically burning energy for, well, kind of nothing. But, uh, you know, there are some solutions, some technological solutions to this, and tape is actually a pretty good one. If you agree that data is important and we should save it and store it for the future, then you should kind of be excited about LTO9 and the future of tape technology, because frankly, uh, nothing is as environmentally sensitive and environmentally uh, uh, saving uh, energy, saving money, saving the planet as storing things on offline tape media instead of on disk or on SSDs or in a blockchain. So frankly, from my perspective, I was very, very glad to see the uh, LTO launch. And I'm really looking forward to seeing if maybe we can take a little bit of the FUD around tape away. Tom, uh, everybody on the planet was affected by the big news story of October. Well, everybody who uses Facebook. Tell us a little bit more. Well, I love the fact that Mark Zuckerberg and his team decided to do the largest scale test of Hanlon's razor ever, which is never attribute to malice that which can be accu uh, accurately described by stupidity. Um, for those of you who don't know, Facebook has a very large network infrastructure, and sometimes people do stupid things when they push changes into production. And effectively what they did is they pushed a change that cut off their internal network, and their external network saw that they couldn't reach it, so they withdrew all of their external routes. So Facebook went down about 9 o'clock in the morning, and the entire world freaked out. And then the fun started. Then we started hearing the reports that the teams who managed the physical infrastructure couldn't get into the devices in order to be able to reset them, that the data centers all had badge readers that wouldn't be able to be accessed, that the keys on the data center racks were run by the same badge system that was currently down. Like we were hearing reports that people had to go dig up an angle grinder to be able to cut into the cages to flip the switches to revert the changes. And then, of course, the rumors started. Well, you know, a lot of bad news came out for Facebook yesterday about some of the stuff they're doing. So maybe they took this down on their own. Huh? Huh? And I'm not one to subscribe to conspiracy theories as evidenced by the fact, you know, Hanlon's razor, malice versus stupidity. I legitimately think that what happened was is that somebody did something they weren't supposed to. And just like we fear, automation said, you know what? I'm going to do it much quicker and much dumber than that. And so we're still kind of recalculating what happens when a large system that a lot of people rely on goes down. If it's Amazon, it's one thing. Although we are starting to hear stories, you know, like when Amazon goes down, suddenly my Roomba won't vacuum my house or my smart lock doesn't work. But Facebook, in my mind, is a little less impactful from a, from a, a necessity standpoint, unless you're using login with Facebook. But more importantly, it's the perception that a service like this that's not supposed to go down or that's supposed to fail in stages failed completely. And for the record, I will remind everybody that while this was technically the result of something interacting with DNS, it was actually a BGP problem. And if you go check out my latest episode of Conversations about how fragile BGP really is, you'll know that this was probably just something that was bound to happen. It's not a question of if, but when. Um, but Stephen, when we speak about big companies, I mean, we have to talk about the behemoth that is Dell and Dell Technologies. But they're missing a part because back in November, we got the completion of an announcement that happened back in April, which is Dell decided they wanted to spin out VMware. Um, they sent the stepchild off to college. You're on your own now. We trust you. You can do your thing. We kind of wondered at the time, though, was there any kind of maybe discussion about what had happened with some of the changing of the guard and a lot of the people that were departing and now all of a sudden they're shoved out the door? 
What does that mean? How is the special financing stuff involved? What, you know, you know as much about this as anybody else. What was your take on the fact that VMware was kind of sent off and said, have fun? Well, I think a lot of us expected this to happen at some point. So when Dell bought uh, EMC, which owned VMware, one of the crown jewels of that acquisition was VMware itself. Uh, this is a company that has become an essential staple of the enterprise data center and now has transformed itself pretty successfully into the main purveyor of what uh, enterprises are calling hybrid cloud. This gave Dell a tremendous, tremendous advantage when they were going to market with enterprise customers uh, in terms of selling servers and storage devices and so on, because frankly, they owned uh, VMware. They were obviously going to have a seat at the table at any announcements that VMware made, and they were going to be probably the uh, preferred, if not one of the preferred hardware platforms for all of those products. And that's exactly what we saw for years and years. But I think most people expected that at some point, uh, Dell would spin off VMware, and that's exactly what they did. Frankly, uh, the acquisition, everything, uh, the, the, the Dell going private and going public again and all that, uh, all of this left Dell with a tremendous, tremendous amount of debt. Uh, VMware was spinning off money like a software company, whereas Dell was kind of spinning their wheels like a hardware company and still servicing this massive, massive debt load. So uh, VMware uh, needed to go. And that's exactly what happened. So finally in November, we saw the uh, successful spin out of VMware. Um, it has been interesting to see what's happened since then, though. Effectively, uh, Dell uh, stock has jumped substantially and uh, remained there uh, pretty high. Uh, if you look at the stock market chart, it effectively goes boink and then stays high for the rest of the year and until now. Um, whereas if you look at VMware, it's the opposite story. Effectively, VMware was pretty high and then boink, jumped, jumped a little bit lower uh, right after the uh, spin out. Why is that? Well, it's nothing to do with VMware's products or technology or anything. It's the fact that VMware now is holding a lot of that debt instead of Dell. And frankly, that's what happened. That's what was meant to happen. Uh, I don't want to say it's deserved because, quite frankly, uh, VMware had very little to do with this whole transaction. It was more about Michael Dell and what was going on with Dell and EMC and all that than it was uh, anything involving VMware. But VMware is holding the bag, financially speaking. That being said, you know, VMware is a software company. They've done a nice job in transitioning into this hybrid cloud market. They have done a great job embracing Kubernetes and uh, offering compelling products and storage servers, uh, security, networking. And frankly, uh, I think VMware has a pretty solid future. So I expect that eventually VMware is going to recover and pay off some of that uh, good old Dell debt. And Dell is going to be uh, smiling uh, as they have a lot less debt to service going forward. So frankly, it's been, it was a big story, but apart from the Wall Street implications, um, it hasn't yet been much of anything else. I think that going forward, it's going to help VMware to be free a little from Dell, even though, of course, they're still a little bit related. Um, and I think that that's going to be good for the industry as a whole. So Tom... Just like last year when we finished up the year with the uh, SolarWinds uh, vulnerability, uh, I think this year we've got a big story here coming uh, as a Christmas present. And that, of course, is LogForge. Tell us about it. Man, if this is a Christmas present, this is the biggest lump of coal that Santa Claus has ever given to anybody. And yeah, I, I do remember the parallels of, boy, I wonder if there's going to be a big security news story drop in December this year. And oh boy, did it. Um, so I'm sure because we just covered this last week on the rundown, it's only about a week and a half old. Effectively, what happened is Alibaba Cloud found out that there was a huge exploitable vulnerability using malformed um, indicators passing instructions into a logging platform that's used by basically every Java app on the planet because <laughs> it was free and maintained by like four people. And so this is an, like the SolarWinds story. This is a story that's still developing as we're still starting to find out more and more stuff. I mean, there's reports today of massive exploits that are being run on a on an hourly basis. I mean, like I mentioned last week in the rundown, my friends were saying that a lot of their inbound traffic that was trying to take advantage of this wasn't 
criminal actors. It was researchers trying to find out who was affected. And uh, I remember uh, talking to a bunch of the folks that I know online. They were starting to see uh, crypto miners getting dropped on uh, affected systems. And they're like, you know, everyone's like, oh, my God, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to mine cryptocurrency. I'm like, no, they're not. They're they're seeing what's exploitable and they're dropping something on there to earn a few bucks while they wait to figure out how to really own the system. And I think that you know, the, the parallels to SolarWinds are actually really important because SolarWinds very much was the elitist hack done by uh, an APT team that, you know, that did the work. They got in, they they persisted, they, they mangled the system, and then they got access to the targets that they wanted. That, to me, was the Ocean's Eleven bank rob or casino robbery. A highly skilled team that got in and did the, the job targeting who they wanted. This is the apocalypse. This is bedlam, basically, where it's democratized. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do to get it to exploit. Go have fun. Go to Shodan and attack everything you can find. And that's what we're seeing. I mean, we're finding out so many tools that used LogForge that we didn't have, we no idea about, and it's just getting worse. Um, we're, we're really deep into the idea of, well, what happens if we do a code merge with a branch later on that had the vulnerability? Uh, are we going to have to put these URL filters on our external firewalls in order to block these things from coming inside? Is LDAP even going to be functional anymore? Um, this is a big story. I mean, we, we kind of mentioned it on the rundown last week. It's absolutely the hack of the year. It's very possibly the hack of the decade or worse. Like we may never find the bottom of this. And we're already starting to see people combining these exploits. I think my favorite one was people using LogForge to exploit a critical Linux system to put a Mirai botnet back on it. Like, you know, this is the equivalent of catching a disease that leaves you vulnerable to like getting the plague or smallpox. It's like, we thought we dealt with this already. I guess we didn't. So uh, fingers crossed that this ends up being a, a, a non-story, but I don't think we're going to see that. All right, Stephen, we talked a lot about stories, but we kind of hinted at the fact that there are some themes that kind of ran through a lot of the things that we talked about throughout the year. And I wanted to step back with you and take kind of a look at the bigger picture. For you, I think the biggest picture item that I can think of is the idea of the global chip shortage. I mean, we've seen Intel struggling with it. We've seen it causing companies to buy other companies to consolidate. We've heard stories about lead times of equipment stretching out into months or even like six to nine months lead time. How has the global chip shortage really affected the IT industry in 2021? Surprisingly, the uh, global chip shortage hasn't affected the IT industry as much as many of us had feared. I think a lot of us were bracing ourselves for massive uh, misses from big tech companies like Dell and HPE and Cisco as they weren't able to supply uh, you know, IT equipment because of the lack of chips. But instead, what we've seen is that the global chip shortage is affecting basically everything to equal measure. And I think that that's really the takeaway here on this story. Rather than being a uh, challenge that is borne by tech companies, it's a challenge that's being borne by everyone. So, for instance, if you want a new car, uh, chances are it might not come with a navigation system or a touchscreen or automatic uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous driving modes and things like that, because frankly, those companies can't find things. I've heard of, uh, you know, auto companies uh, reverting to old manual controls simply because they can't get the power control chips or the little microprocessors that they need. But that being said, uh, we have seen people rolling out brand new technologies like these Ice Lake CPUs that we talked about and AMD's Epic CPUs and the new GPUs. All that stuff is still coming out. It's just uh, there's a giant bottleneck around it. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like this situation is going to get solved anytime soon. Even though we're hearing a lot of talk about, uh, you know, bringing in uh, federal funding in the U.S. to build a new fab uh, new chip manufacturing capabilities and all that. Frankly, a lot of that stuff hasn't come to fruition and won't come to fruition for a while. I'm just going to tell you that uh, I have a lot of contact with industry analysts and they follow this situation very closely. And the truth is that this thing is not going to be resolved in 2022. It probably will last well into 2023, if not longer than that. 
And none of these things that are happening are going to fix it. They're not bad. I applaud the government uh, for supplying funding for this. I applaud Intel and Samsung and all these other companies for building new fabs and building new capacity. But truly what's going to stop this is uh, when the entire industry just has a more diversified supplier base and a wider uh, network of suppliers overall. And I think that that's really going to take a few more years. So this is a story, frankly, that is kept on giving and is going to keep on giving. Another story that uh, strikes me very much the same is the story about malware and ransomware. If you've listened to this episode, you've heard there's just more and more and more coming out. Uh, Tom, are we ever going to be away from this? No, I don't think we are. I, I think that we have hit a point of saturation here where... Um, you know, when we when we talk in security circles, we we talk about the fact that no information is truly private on the internet. And worse yet, there are certain kinds of information that are super valuable. Think about AWS API keys or secrets that get exposed. If those secrets get exposed on the public internet in a GitHub repo for some reason, because you accidentally hit publish without obscuring them, don't assume that they're secret anymore. There are bots that are designed to grab that information. So we just live in a world now where if your API key is published in, in the clear, it's assumed to be invalid. I think we're at that point with malware. It's no longer a question of if your company will get infected by it. It's a question of when, and it's a question of how bad. And we, uh, you, you hinted at this. We specifically covered, I think we got to the point by August where we're like, we are trying not to cover malware stories because they're everywhere. We hinted at Colonial Pipeline. But we didn't talk about Kaseya, where they used uh, the actual fleet management software to deploy the malware in a brilliant hack. Uh, the fact that there is currently a cream cheese shortage on the East Coast because the major producer of cream cheese in Wisconsin got hit by one of these buggers. Uh, in fact, uh, there are companies that are even paying you not to make a cheesecake this year because that's how short it is. Um, major restaurant chains had to cut, completely change their menus because they couldn't get roast beef. Like, you think about hacks that are bad. We talked about Siemens. That was a bad hack. We talked about Garmin, where they effectively had to pay the Lazarus Group to unlock the GPS systems in cars. That's bad. But when you start affecting supply chains, fuel, um, food, like that's major. And we're starting to see this. And I, I remember because I, I went back and I, I found a, a, an article that I wrote uh, many, many years ago, I think almost 10 years ago, where I talked about this idea behind a like a cyber Geneva convention where there are just certain targets you don't hit like hospitals. Well, good luck there. We're starting to see hospitals get hit by this stuff. And that has a legitimate impact, a body count, which is morbid to think about. But could you imagine what would happen if Colonial Pipeline had hit now or earlier in the year when we had a cold snap that drove temperatures 10 to 20 below zero? Could you imagine if the Texas power grid got hit by a, a massive malware outbreak? I don't have to imagine what that feels like anymore. I think it's going to happen. I think we have reached the point where crews are going to spring up, they're going to do the job, and then they're going to disappear because we've seen that over and over again. And, and going back to Kaseya and Revil, which was one of our most popular um, uh, topics this year, like the FBI had them cold and they still disappeared into thin air. They've been clawing back these Bitcoin ransoms as fast as they can, and yet the groups still have enough funding to keep popping up this is going to turn into a comedy of errors sooner or later. And unfortunately, with the current geopolitical situation in the, in, the, in the world, they're being sheltered in places where Western law enforcement can't get to them. And I don't think that that situation is going to change in 2022, which is sad, but it's the reality that we have to face. But I will say something interesting that did come out of this as kind of a, an ancillary that kind of crosses over in both of our areas. And that was this idea that backup and recovery and disaster recovery vendors effectively have pivoted to become data protection companies. I mean, we saw it with uh, companies like Cohesity and Rubrik. We saw it at the, the Commvault uh, show that we both took part in uh, this year, where effectively these companies have rebranded. They're no longer disaster recovery if your data center gets blown out by a tornado. It's what happens when your company gets completely infected by ransomware. And so I thought that that was a really interesting kind of trend to, to look at in 2022 as we move forward is that a lot of companies who have kind of built their, their business on what is a disaster that we can help you recover from have had to go back and reassess, well, what does a disaster actually look like? 
Yeah, that's true. And, um, you know, speaking of trends from uh, 2022, uh, Tom, what is your big prediction? What do you think we're going to see in 2022 uh, overall? What's 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 the one thing that you're going to be looking for? You know, I thought long and hard about this, and we've had a lot of interesting things that have happened over the year. Um, I honestly think that we are going to see a blockbuster acquisition absolutely flattened by the US FCC. Um, we've seen it kind of as a setup already where we've had, you know, Jessica Rosenworcel, who was uh, appointed to the FCC. We've had hints of it with some of the other acquisitions that we spent a lot of the time talking about. And obviously the the go-to here would be NVIDIA and ARM, but I think that this is something else. I think that there's going to be a large acquisition that gets announced and the FCC is going to step in and kind of flex their muscles again to show that they're not just rubber stamping these acquisitions. And I think it's going to have a material impact on what's going on in Silicon Valley. And it's going to cause us to have to reassess how we're seeing essentially these companies getting vacuumed up by large holding companies, by large organizations and creating these, these like holding company Voltrons. Um, something's going to happen and it's going to cause a shock throughout the system. That's my big prediction. What about you, Stephen? Well, you know, I'm actually going to take the other side of this uh, bet. My big, uh, my big prediction for 2022 is that we are finally going to see the emergence of mega competitors in the IT space. I think that what's happening right now uh, with a lot of the acquisitions that we're seeing uh, is companies raising their hands to compete with Intel. And frankly, that's what I'm going to be looking for in 2022. I think that the acquisitions that NVIDIA has made and the acquisitions that AMD has made and is going to make are going to better and better and better position them to compete with Intel. I do not think that the ARM acquisition with NVIDIA is going to go through. In fact, I think that ARM is going to effectively set themselves up as a uh, provider uh, to multiple competitors for Intel. But that being said, I truly believe that we are going to see a situation where we're going to have a few massive competitors duking it out all the way from the server down to the device level. I think Intel is going to com con continue to focus on building server platforms, uh, mobile device platforms. Intel is going to get more and more into wireless, 3G, mobility, edge, AI, uh, GPU, networking, all of that in order to build a big, massive thing that competes in all sorts of spaces. And you know what's going to happen then? NVIDIA is going to come in with their own competition, and they're going to go after Intel. They're going to go after Intel in networking, which they've already done with Mellanox. They're going to go after Intel by building disaggregated systems that rely less and less on the CPU and more and more on GPUs and other kind of processing units, which is exactly what they're doing right now. We're going to see AMD, and we're going to see AMD realize that just having the best CPU isn't enough. You have to have the best platform. And that's why AMD is in the process of buying Xilinx, a, an acquisition that's going to happen any day now. It's going to be approved by the Mofcom in China. And then we're going to see a better competitor with Intel's uh, Ice Lake platform. Similarly, I expect AMD to make some other big acquisitions this year to better set themselves up to compete with Intel. And then we've got all the rest of the industry, you know, all these other companies, Micron and MediaTek and Qualcomm everybody else is looking and figuring out how can they work into this and don't count out Samsung either. I think they could be a big competitor for Intel if only they make the moves. So that for me is what I'm going to be looking for here. I'm going to be looking for a truly competitive market where we have companies that are vertically integrated all the way from servers to networking to mobile devices and the edge competing, duking it out on a massive, massive scale. And frankly, I think that this stuff will get approved because everybody loves competition. Everybody in the world loves competition. And these are truly global companies. That's my prediction for 2022. Well, there you have it, folks. Two big predictions. And we have to see which one of them is right. And the only way that you'll be able to see which one is right is if you tune into The Rundown every Wednesday, 1230 Eastern Time. Stephen and I bring you the news that we find throughout the week. Sometimes it's uh, interesting little stories about things like AI or storage or networking. Sometimes it's these big 
picture kind of things the you know the the pat gelsingers of the world or the malware infections that you need to be aware of but we're going to be doing this every week because you should know what's going on in the news space so please make sure that you tune in every week if you're not able to tune in or you want to catch us a little bit later you can always do that by subscribing in your favorite podcast application of choice you can also subscribe to our youtube channel we publish all the videos there as well and while you're there, make sure you check out all the other stuff that we do here at Gestalt IT. We have the on-premise IT roundtable podcast. We have conversations and checksums. Uh, we have a lot of other content that you definitely don't want to miss because it kind of fills in some of the gaps around some of the things that you're seeing here. It's not just the news. It's the analysis of what the news means for you and, and how that can affect you going into 2022. Also, don't forget that we also have a, a successful event called Tech Field Day that we do throughout the year as well, where we get to talk to the interesting companies that you see featured in the rundown and uh, learn a little bit more about their technology and their vision for what they want to do in the future. And if you want to check that information out, head over to techfieldday.com because we have the entire list for the first half of the year of all the events that we're doing, and you can set your calendar, uh, make sure that you don't miss that. Stephen, if people want to follow your thoughts about IT and things like that online, where can they go to do that? Well, the best place to follow me is by just following what we do, uh, Tech Field Day, Gestalt IT, and of course, at S. Foskett on Twitter and most other social media platforms. Uh, one more thing I'll mention that I'm super proud of is the Utilizing AI podcast, which is a weekly podcast published every Tuesday where we talk about uh, practical applications of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. And frankly, that again is something that's going to be coming down the road. And so you don't want to miss utilizing AI. And if you want to follow the things that I do related to networking and wireless and security, um, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Networking Nerd, and I'm Networking Nerd on most platforms as well. So you can do that. Um, and I, I promise that I'll bring you some interesting things with maybe just a little bit of snark because that's what I do. But rest assured, uh, Stephen and I are going to take next week off. We're going to recharge our batteries a little bit. Hopefully nothing exciting happens in that week. But I promise you that if it does, we're going to take notes of it. And we're going to be back with you in 2022 for the first rundown of the year in January. And if there's any news stories that you think are interesting that you want to make sure that we cover on the rundown, please make sure you tweet at us. We're at Gestalt IT. Put the hashtag rundown on it. And I promise you that we're going to see it. Um, but for myself for Stephen Foskett, for the amazing staff here at Gestalt IT that helps us produce the rundown every week, including our hey, amazing yeah, video Hey, yeah, cheers Abby. for Abby. Yes, Abby, thank you very much for putting up with us all year long. We hope that you continue to do so in the next year. And for you, the community that supports us and loves what we do, thank you very much for an amazing 2021. And here's hoping that next year is an amazing one as well. Thank you all very much, and we will see you soon.